Welcome to Advanced Domains Tutorial. This tutorial builds on the content shown in Data to Analysis Tutorial and the Basics Domains Tutorial. If you haven't watched them, I would really advise you to watch those tutorials first and then come back to Advanced Domains Tutorial. In this tutorial, we'll cover following topics. Derived Tables. Derived Tables allow the Domain Designer Admin to build database views or virtual tables that can combine data across multiple tables and build a subset of information. These derived tables can be used across domains in joins or data presentation. Next, we'll look at profile attributes. Profile attributes allow the domain designer admin to build parameterized and dynamic domains that can be easily migrated across users, tenants, and environments. Then we'll look at joins optimization, where we'll look at the different options a domain designer admin has to control the generated SQL. We'll look at all joins versus minimum joins and within minimum joins we'll look at join weights and always include table options. Lastly we'll look at domain dependency where we'll talk about the internal and the external domain dependencies. Let's start with our first topic derived tables. Derived tables allows a domain designer admin to define database views which can combine data across one or multiple tables and it is completely based on a SQL statement. To understand derived tables better, let's define a requirement. My requirement is to combine the data in employee and department tables. But I don't want to look at the entire employee table. I only want to look at employees whose salary is greater than employee ID 50. For that, I have to create a subset of employee table. That's where the derived tables come into picture. So I'll right click on the data source and say create derived table. First, I'll give the derived table a name. I'll give it a name called employee underscore sub and then comes the query. I define my sub query saying select star from employee where salary is greater than select salary from employee where employee id equals 50 and then I'll click on run query. On the click of run query it does a syntax check and ensures that the, the SQL is correct syntactically and it turns me all the columns from that query. I click on create derived table. It creates the derived table and puts that under the derived tables folder. Now I have the employee sub table and the department table and I can go to joins and I can create a join between them. So this part of the tutorial shows why do we need a derived table and how do we create one in domain designer. Let's look at our next topic profile attributes. Profile attributes can be defined as user defined variables or parameters in Jasper port server that can be set at user level, tenant level, or server level. These profile attributes can be consumed in different places in Jasper Reports server, but in this tutorial, we'll look at their consumption in domains and how it makes domain completely dynamic. Similar to derived tables, let's understand the usage of profile attributes by defining a requirement. Let's assume I'm a domain designer admin. In the dev environment, I create a domain using public schema. Now I move the same schema to test environment and in the test environment the name of the schema is caught however the underlying structure that is the tables fields and data types is exactly the same. I don't want to go into the test environment and change the name to Scott. This is where profile attributes can really help. Before we actually define a domain let's go ahead and create a couple of profile attributes. For that I'll go to manage server settings and server attributes. I have defined two profile attributes. The first one is schema. So you can see the name of the profile attribute is schema and the value is public. The second one is employee ID with a value of 50. Let's go into our domains. Our usual approach would have been to select public schema and move it to the right section. However, we want to make it completely dynamic and we want to use profile attributes. So we'll go here, put our profile attribute. There's a syntax which is attribute, schema name, and the level. The level can be user level, tenant level, server level. In this example, we are using a server level attribute and I'll say add to threaded schemas. Now it immediately recognizes from the profile attribute that the value is public for this particular server. Now I can get all the tables. So when I move this particular domain across different environments, it will read the value of the profile attribute in, this in that particular environment and get the value. This will make the domain completely dynamic. Let us look at our next use case. We'll go back to our derived table. 
In the derived table definition, we were using a hard-coded value called 50 for the employee ID. What if I want to make it completely dynamic and not use a hard-coded value? I'll simply replace this value with a profile attribute or a variable and it will work exactly the same. So in this part of the tutorial, we covered what are profile attributes, what are the different use cases for them and how do we consume them in domains. In this section of the tutorial, we'll look at the advanced join options a domain designer has while creating a join tree and the impact of these options on the resulting query from ad hoc view. To explain the concept, I've created a simple join with three different tables, department, salary and employee. They're all joined to each other. In the data presentation section, I have one field each from each table. We'll start with the all joins options. The purpose of all joins is to ensure that every table which is part of the join tree is part of the resulting SQL query, even though fields from each of the table are not part of the ad hoc view. Let's go to the ad hoc view. I have one field each from employee table and salary table. Typically, we would expect a join to happen only between employee and salary. But since we have selected all joins, we'll see even the department table to be part of the join query. Let's look at the vSQL query. You can see even the department is part of the join query. This way, the domain designer can enforce all the tables to be part of the resulting query, even though they are not part of the ad hoc query. Let's switch it up. Now I'll mark this to be a minimum join. Save the domain and go back to the ad hoc query. Now for the exact same analysis, where I have one field from employee and one from salary, let's look at the query. Now you can see we don't have department in the SQL join because we have enforced a minimum path. Since we only have two tables, it is trying to create a join which takes the minimum path between these two tables. Within minimum join, we have two more options. The first option is a join weights. By default, every join expression is assigned a join weight of 1, as you can see here. Let me change the join weights to explain the concept. I'll put the join weight between salary and employee to be 5 and re leave the rest as 1. I'll go ahead and save the domain. Going back to the same query, I only have fields from salary and employee and I would expect the join only to happen between salary and employee. Since it is set to minimum path, the system will try to look for the minimum part between salary and employee. But when you look at the query, you'll see the department is part of the query right now. Why this is happening is because the weight between salary and employee is set to 5 and the other path between salary and employee is via salary, department, department, employee and the combined weight is 2. So it finds this weight, this path to be of lower weight and the system will try to go for the lowest weight while traversing between two tables. The last option within minimum path join is something called always include table. I can click on any table and right click and say always include table. It's like a forced join where I want a particular table to be part of join expression irrespective of whether it's part of the ad hoc query or not. I'll save the domain and I'll go back to the ad hoc query. Going back to the same query, I have salary and employee table all the weights are set to 1, so the weights doesn't matter. And the join is set to minimum path. You would expect the salary and employee table to be part of the join expression and not the department table. But since we have said on the department table as always include table, the resulting query will have the department table. So in this tutorial, we saw the different advanced join options a domain designer has while creating a domain and the impact of those in the ad hoc views and the resulting query. In the last part of the tutorial, we'll cover domain dependency. We'll talk about two dependencies. One is the dependency within the domain and the other which is external to domain like the dependency of an ad hoc view on a domain. To explain the concept of domain dependency, I've created a domain which is called base domain. You can see all the joins. I've created four join trees, employee join, sales join, expense join and inventory join. And I have pulled multiple fields from different join trees into my data presentation tab. Let's go back to the data management tab. I'll try to remove a couple of tables. The moment we try to remove the table, it gives us a warning dialog box and says making this change will affect the following items. It lists down all the dependent items. If I say 
It will remove all the fields from presentation, but I get a status icon on the Joins tab. It shows me the sales join is now incomplete. So I can fix it by removing these sections. Now the sales join is fine and the domain is in valid state. If I go back to the data presentation section, all the fields which are part of that particular table has been removed. I can always undo this by clicking an undo button again, again. The same applies if I try to replace a data source with another data source and the underlying data structure is not the same. The moment I say replace data source, first it will try to map the two schemas from each data source. Once I'm done with the schema mapping, it will try to match each and every table, field and the data type from the two schemas. And wherever it cannot find the match, it will list it down and will ask me to delete the items. To explain the concept of external domain dependency, I have created an ad hoc view based on this base domain. Then I'll go back to my domain and I'll try to remove a couple of fields which were used in that ad hoc view. I'll remove the store sales and the store type. I'll save the domain. When I save the domain, it doesn't give me any warning that there is a dependent ad hoc view. When I open that ad hoc view, the system gives me a warning that the following fields or measures no longer exist in the data source. And I can remove the items and get the ad hoc view back in the working state. So here we saw how the domain manages the internal dependency as well as the external dependency. This concludes the advanced domains tutorial where we covered derived tables, profile attributes, advanced joins and domain dependency. For more tutorials on domains and other topics, you can visit our YouTube page as shown here.